So we're absolutely delighted to have um, uh, uh, Marion and Tanvi, who, uh, who is, are talking about um, uh, the research for uh, patient benefits. So Marion Knight is the new director. When did you start? First uh, of May. So brand new director for the research for patient benefit. Um, and uh, she's a, also a professor of maternal and child population health at the National Perinatal Epidemi Epidemiology Unit, um, part of Oxford Health Population. Um, and Tanvi has a PhD in, in public health and she is actually a co-applicant um, on a research for patient benefit um, or a PI, excuse me, yeah, sorry, a, she's a co-applicant, I'm sorry, I'm reading very quickly, on an EPSRC funded grant, but more importantly, a PI on a research for patient benefit um, grant. So we've asked them to, to speak to, to us as a, as a group on um, coming from the funder side and from the applicant side around, um, you know, things that work. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So, so in case you want to switch off or you fall asleep, depending on the temperature here and, and, uh, and, and at home on your Zoom calls, I'm going to give you my main message. Don't underestimate how stupid the funding panel are. <laughs> I'll explain that as I go along. So just to tell you a little bit about RFPB, because I want all of your brilliant applications, um, it's a response, mo a response mode programme. So that means we will take all of your ideas, um, uh, uh, unless perhaps you're very, very lab based. Um, important restriction is, is in relation to the amounts of funding. So we, we only fund projects which cost up to 350,000. Um, and those are definitive projects. They may be trials, but uh, I'm an epidemiologist. Actually, you know, we all know we can get definitive answers that are gonna make a difference to people with, uh, with um, uh, epidemiological projects that are not uh, randomized trials. We fund uh, feasibility studies up to 250,000 and more upstream studies. So those where you want to find out, well, well what is it I need to design to then um, think about the, the trial or the feasibility study um, up to 150,000. Um, we do that three times a year. So, you know, you don't have to panic if you have an idea today and there happens to be a funding deadline in about three weeks time, you can wait four months and three weeks for the next round. Um, what's really good, why I love RFPB is that we're regional. So we have regional funding committees. So um, wherever you are based in, in England, um, there will be a committee in your region. So they will understand the regional needs. And that's really important when we're thinking about inequalities and what specific needs are. And so far, we've funded more than a thousand projects, so so lots, uh, lots to, to fund. Um, the uh, main sort of uh, types of studies that we have are those that are preliminary when we're thinking about a major application. Um, we do have a few trials, um, many around how we provide services, should they be tailored for different populations. Um, and we do like innovation, so we like when you're, uh, if, if you've had an observation that something seems to be working in your local population, do the research to show that that really is the case. Um, and we, we accept lots of different methods. Uh, we do have some um, specific calls and we will be having more um, regional, regional specific calls uh, addressing where there are specific health needs. So we've had, uh, a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in the northeast. We've had mental health in the north, um, and we've got more in planning. So keep your eyes open for those. Um, we've had additional uh, social care calls, specifically relating to dementia and and mental health. But I hope when you all look at this graph, you can all see something on this pie chart where your niche particularly fits. Uh, as I said, we will take uh, uh, research in, in any area. One uh, exciting new development for if there are any uh, social care researchers in the room or those of you who, who focus particularly on, on uh, populations who are um, high users of social care is that we've now got the research for social care 
um, part of our FPB, which we now have uh, funding calls twice a year. Uh, the panel uh, is a national panel, but it's made up of uh, social care researchers, so they will know the area. Um, and now we've got about 30 projects, and um, we each round we're getting a, between 10 and 12 different applications for, uh, for funding through that. Um, there's a bit of a wider eligibility, so you don't have to get your funding through, a, through an NHS organisation. Um, otherwise, very similar. So, um, which you apply to out of those depends really on um, a, a few things. Research setting, who's delivering the intervention, uh, what the population are, are, and what are the outcome measures. If you're looking at a health outcome, it's probably RFPB. If you're looking at a care outcome, it might be our RFSC. Um, but actually, um, we see quite a lot of social care focused research even within RFPB. So why have I told you all of this? I'm told they have to shake this to make it work. Let me try again. Oh. <laughs> no, it's not wanting to, it's not wanting to play ball. I will try again. No. Uh, so why have I told you all this? I've told you all this because the most important thing about your application is making sure that you're tailoring it to the right program. Um, I don't know if there's anybody who can move. Ah, there we go. Um, we uh, welcome new investigators. As, as Anne-Marie said, about half of our funded applications every round have a lead early career researcher, often uh, with a co-lead who is an experienced uh, researcher, so that we are very keen to see that mentorship uh, role. The most important thing for us is not your experience as the lead, it's whether you've got that support behind you. And, and as, as you heard in the introduction, this, this programme is your best opportunity for, for early uh, career researchers to be a lead um, applicant. Yeah. No, I've got a different one. Marvellous. Thank you. Great. Um, if you want to look at case studies, we've got a series of case studies on the RFP web, RFPB website from um, uh, researchers. In fact, I don't think you're, you're not one of them. No, but, um, but, but hopefully you will see um, early career researchers such as yourselves uh, describing their success stories. So, as I was starting to say, know your target. The most important thing is that you don't actually waste your time by putting your application into a program that it's not designed for. Um, and that is all around what your research question is. Uh, need to work out that you're eligible for support. Um, there are some programs that have very specific um, requirements around who uh, can be funded. It's worth thinking about how the application will be assessed and who will assess the application, when uh, it will be assessed, how long typically the, the funding amount is. Clearly, if you've got a, a, a question that requires follow-up for eight years, probably RFPB is not going to be the right thing for you because typically our studies are only around three years. Um, you need to know how much money it's going to take because that might be a, a limiting factor. Um, and looking at who's had, research, who's had awards before will help you um, get some idea of that. So this is where I said don't underestimate how stupid uh, the, the panel are. Um, tell them the story and tell it them logically and simply. Um, start with your research question. Everything should flow logically from there. Um, don't assume that any of us have any expertise in your topic area. Uh, I, I'm a researcher in, in maternal and child health, so if you start talking to me about dementia, you really do need to explain it simply, uh, because I will never encounter dementia in, in my research career. And explain to us why it's important, and that's where, you know, you've just had your talk about PPI. Actually, your, your, your PPI advisors will be really key in giving you why it's important to them. And if we as a panel are convinced that your question is an important one to answer for that population, we're actually going to be very, very uh, forgiving 
of any slight uh, flaws that we think in the methods. And actually, that's where we will say to you after a stage one application, could you just change this? We think that it, it, will, it will work better if you tweak it this way. Um, so if we're convinced that it's a good question and it's important, that's when you'll make us feel all warm and fuzzy and we'll want to be nice to you. Um, the methods do need to be appropriate, um, but as I said, we, we are forgiving uh, of, of things that we think might be slightly different if, if we're feeling warm and fuzzy. Um, you will see, this is uh, just a, an example from one of the rounds of the feedback, typical feedback to, to applicants. And the main uh, top four are around the, those details of the methods, uh, the team, we need to know that you've got the right expertise behind you, uh, recruitment, whether we think that's, that's going to be difficult and, and appropriate design. So, what is an important and interesting research question? Well, you'll go through a lot of that uh, in those of you who are in the room uh, over the next few days um, online. Uh, I, I'm sure you've already got lots of ideas of, of, your, of your own. Um, what I need to know is, is what is the trajectory from this question to benefit to people? Uh, I need to be able to see logically how answering this question will make a difference to people and whether the methods you choose will, um, will enable that. Um, the team needs to reflect the nature of your proposed work. I'm not going to expect you to need a statistician if you're undertaking a qualitative research project. And I need to know what every co-applicant uh, is doing. Um, and actually, it makes no difference to have Professor Sir God and Dame Marvellous on your application if I'm not convinced they're actually going to do any work, what, you, what, I, what the panel need to be convinced by is that you've got the team, they're going to contribute and they're going to, to support you. And, and that's where you as an early career researcher may, need to make it very clear uh, who it is who's going to be your main source of support. Um, maybe a joint lead, but it doesn't have to be, but just make it clear um, how they're going to support you. Um, before you submit, make sure somebody has read your application who's not an expert in your topic area. Um, RDS are brilliant for this kind of thing. Uh, I, I call it the will my mum understand it test because she's my go-to person. She's a, a maths teacher. So I figure if she understands the research application, then, then that's probably a good, uh, a good test um, of, of the level of understanding. Um, your public advisors are, are also very helpful. Check that you've not fallen into the, any of the easy traps that annoy panels. Um, my particular bugbear is acronym soup. Um, you all have uh, short, you know, RFPB case in point. You all have acronyms that you will use all the time, but most of the time we all have different acronyms. And if you all think about the terms PDS, for example. I bet it means a different thing to almost all of you. Um, try and avoid overly technical language as well, um, and, and it, you will make uh, peop some people are particularly annoyed by spelling and grammatical errors. And this is what you want to avoid your panel looking like when they're trying to read your application. They don't understand the letters, they really struggling with the technical, or actually they're just bored, they can't see the so what factor. So how do we assess your applications? Um, we have stage one, um, we receive for each stage one, so that's every four months, about 120 to 130 applications. So making yours easy to read, logical, we can see how A leads to B, uh, uh, leads to C, that will make it stand out. And it'll mean thinking of the, the typical panel member who is doing this on top of their normal uh, research. They might be reading these applications of an evening um, in between student supervisions when they haven't got a lot of time. Make it really clear. Um, as I said, we have eight regional funding committees. We've got a wide range of expertise, so there will be uh, methodologists on the panel who will understand uh, the methods that, you've, uh, that you're proposing, even if they're not uh, familiar with the particular topic area. Um, 
at stage two, um, if you're successful at stage one, um, and uh, typically about, uh, about 40% of stage one applications will go through to stage two. Um, take note of what you've been asked to do. Um, if, you've been, if you've been asked to make changes, make those changes and be scrupulously polite about it. And if you think it's nonsense, tell us why um, what we've asked is nonsense, but do do it politely. Um, there are several other sections on your stage two, um, uh, including more detail of, of PPI. At that stage, applications are sent for external review, and that's when people with topic expertise will, will input. Um, so, so at your stage two application, you will be being assessed by uh, peers who are in your research area. Um, those reviews will then go to the committee. Uh, the, the external reviewers obviously comment on all of the different uh, aspects and score your application from one to ten. Um, we exclude people on the committee who have conflicts of interest, so if they're from your institution, and if there's anybody on the committee who is a co-applicant on your grant, it will go to a different committee. Um, main reasons applications are turned down, it's back to that basic um, eligibility and scope criteria for the scheme. Um, RDS, again, are really good at uh, advising you, and within the schools you will have support uh, for advice as to which is the best scheme to, for your research. Um, showing the importance, a clear research question. Um, a, a mission of critical lit literature references can be a problem, particularly if people think there's a perceived overlap with something that you're doing. Um, uh, others are mainly relating to, to, to methodology. We do have to be assured that you can actually reach the patient population or the care population that you are um, intending to. So um, this, is, this is my summary. Um, make us warm and fuzzy. Don't underestimate how stupid we are. And you can do that by making sure the benefit to people is really clear. Specifics about the number of people who may benefit um, evidence that the question is important to patients and the public and, and your PPI is essential, even if it's only a few sentences. Uh, methods need to be very clear. Always write your research question so that we can assess whether your proposed methods will uh, address that question. Um, and think about your team. Make sure you've got all the expertise uh, on that team and it doesn't need to be the great and the good. So that, that's me from one side. I'm now going to hand over to Tanvi, who's going to uh, talk from, from the other side as a successful uh, early career applicant. Thank you. Do you think that these are just... Ah, is it happening automatically or did I do it? Um, hello. I'm actually quite envious of... I think I'm double mic sorry. I might echo. I'm quite envious of all of you because I didn't have this when I applied for my RFPB application. And, and as Marion was speaking, I was thinking, ah, yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think you should kind of, you know, enjoy the, the experience of actually learning it beforehand rather than learning it on the job. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Nourish UK study, which is at the moment, is still ongoing. We're, we're, we're kind of in the final throes of what's called delivery. And I'll explain what that is. So there's a public facing website called healthtalk.org, which uh, has over 120 different um, health conditions. Um, uh, uh, basically, we, we talk to people across the country from all cross sections of life who are going through a particular health condition. And the idea is that it's um, a resource for the public so that, you know, if you are living with a health condition and you might feel that you're the only person who is going through this, you can actually go there. We, and you're not the sort of person who likes to go to a a support a physical support group you can actually go online and have a look at other people going through something similar um, and because we go for, for a maximum variation sample it means that you you are likely to find the same experience that you've had but perhaps by somebody who doesn't look anything like you and um, and the other thing about it is that all of the content apart from you know what people have said we also have 
content which is checked by our, our advisory panel which is made of clinicians so everything is factually correct and we keep going back and updating it. So the Nourish study is going to be another topic on the healthtalk.org website and Nourish is about infant feeding choices amongst, uh, among women and birthing parents living with HIV um, and so you might not know um, uh, but HIV is no longer a, a deadly disease. You can live with it. You can have the same life expectancy as somebody without HIV um, if you're taking treatment. Um, and the special thing about infant feeding choices is that in, while the WHO guidance, which applies to most of the world, is that there is, you know, the data aren't clear enough to be able to say it's safe to, sorry, the data, it's safer to breastfeed than to not breastfeed because the risks from um, potentially diarrheal disease, etc., may be, may be greater than the risk of transmission from HIV because the risk of transmission is really low. It's not zero, though. The UK differs from WHO guidance and says, given that there is no issue of, of unsanitary water, the safest thing to do is to use formula. But you know, updates to that guidance now says that if a woman really, really wants to breastfeed, she should be supported to do so. And the only way to do it safely is to do exclusive breastfeeding. Now we, you know, the idea for this study came because there is this sort of divergence in the, in the guidance that's offered in different parts of the world, high income countries versus the rest of the world, um, as well as you know, as you know, you know, if you have a baby, there's a lot of narrative around breast is best. And then you are kind of told if you have HIV, then probably best not to do it. So there was this kind of what's actually happening. So what we don't know is what's actually happening in the interactions between mothers, pregnant people with HIV and their clinicians and their midwives and the huge amount of stigma that comes with HIV. So, you know, first, you know, what we actually wanted to, wanted to do next was to do an epidemiological study which will actually look test viral content in breast milk um, among women with HIV and then, you know, actually say this is the risk, you know, because that's not been done and that's to do with bias in research when it comes to women, when it comes to, um, you know, HIV, that kind of thing. But before we could do that, we didn't actually even know what's happening in terms of, in terms of these communications and how people are making decisions. So that's how this came about. And also we felt, you know, from talking to uh, women that, you know, that it's actually quite an isolating experience because you're left alone to kind of work out these kind of, you know, great life sort of changing decisions and the, and the evidence to support you is not very clear. Um, and, you know, your doctor is saying one thing, you're mum is saying something else, you're also trying to keep your HIV uh, a secret. So, so that's how it came about. But I'll just go through. So this is what it looked like. Um, it is somehow, it's, 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 uh, it's an acronym in the loosest sense. That's the real title, is a qualitative investigation of attitudes towards infant feeding among new mothers living with HIV in the UK. But somewhere there are the letters that make up nourish. <laughs> Apparently, this is how we do it these days. So, um, so we, so why did we go for our NIHR RFPB? This was because there were, we already had been funded on, on various health talk projects, at least nine. I think there are more. Um, and this is the this is just a screenshot of what they look like. There we go. Okay. So I've talked about the idea. And then there was the issue of, okay, who's our team? So it was actually a medical student who had the idea because she was like, she had obviously had these interactions and felt that it was inadequate what was going on. She came to us. We were like, okay, we can actually do this qualitative study to find out what's happening. And also it can be a resource, not just for patients, but also for clinicians, because they need to see the reasons why people hesitate or, or, you know, or don't know what to do is because they feel like there's all these competing ideas coming to them. And so it's, it's also, you know, Health Talk is also used as a training resource um, for clinicians. Um, and then in terms of the study team, the HIV, I mean, I've done projects on HIV before, um, and it's a very vibrant kind of world in which the clinicians are very much involved in kind of the research side, but also the activism side that's gone on historically with HIV, um, and policy people and advocacy work and support groups um, and all those things. So in terms of the study team, 
um, we have in the core study team, we have two women uh, living with HIV. Also, um, in the UK, HIV disproportionately affects black women, more than 70%. And so in the core team, um, we have two black women living with HIV. Um, and in the advisory panel, we have five more um, who also form a PPI panel. And in the preparation to, for the application, the first thing was getting the study team together. So, um, so I got in touch with a couple of clinicians who've been very active in writing the guidelines um, about infant feeding and felt very strongly about you know, not being able to properly support women. They were very, very keen to come on board, so they came on board. Then we um, uh, also had a PPI, you know, one of the women I, I talked about, um, a mother living with HIV, and then we asked her to identify a, 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 a PPI uh, panel, which was a part of the ad panel, but also separate. So the earlier, um, you know, conversation about having a space to be able to talk about things, we felt from talking to some of the PPI people that there was a possibility that they will not feel confident about speaking in the presence of clinicians. And so in, the, in, in writing the application, we kind of also put in separate meetings where the PPI panel was part of the ad panel, however, and they met for all the ad panel meetings. However, we had three separate uh, meetings that were just the PPI panel meeting just with me and the researcher separate from the clinicians. So the ad panel had the PPI people, as well as clinicians, as well as policy people, as well as people running HIV charities, people running milk bank services, um, you know, basically, and all and representing, you know, all of the UK, because a lot of the kind of main HIV research um, happens, is very London centric. And we, we knew that the kind of care that you get really differs across from where you, where, you know, where you're based. Um, so, so background and rationale, I'm kind of going, going forward and backward, but I've already explained to you that, that, that there is this need of understanding what's happening. And in order to, once we understand what's happening, then, then there should be you know, some progress to actually change what's happening so that, so that women are better supported. Um, aims and objectives we had to make quite clear. Um, as Marion said, you know, what is the aim ultimately for this? So, um, and what are the objectives? So the aim was obviously to understand what's happening, but one of the kind of concrete outcomes of this was going to be this health talk site, which is, um, which we are currently, you know, writing all the, all the public facing material for, and it's really stressful because we have to kind of strike a balance between not saying anything that's factually incorrect, but also validating women's experiences. If they're talking about discrimination, doctors on our team don't like to hear it, but it happened. So we have to kind of find these sort of, you know, we kind of have to make sure that we give women a voice to, to, to be able to talk about their experiences, but to also say that this is what's supposed to happen. Um, uh, so the, so one of the big sections that was important to write, so apart, sorry, apart from, apart from the health talk output, Obviously, we're you know presenting a lot in in conferences. There's there's publications, and also we're producing an infographic, which is going to be both online and on you know on paper, which will be hopefully you know you know using the fact of what the facts of what what, what we've heard women talk about, um, and communicating you know better support. We're also working quite closely with the British HIV Association because two of the study team and a few more of the ad panel are in that, in the, in the writing committee. So they're kind of really interested um, and really kind of plugged into our research because they're finding stuff that they don't know because they most of the time just write the guidelines and they don't see how it falls, how it reads, how does that patient leaflet read to somebody. Um, and we've had feedback about what that's like. Um, so in terms of the outputs, um, we're, you know, we're, kind of, we're kind of working on all of those things as well. Um, dissemination, we've got plans for um, a big kind of launch event um, where we're going to invite all of the participants who took part. We've got, you know, we're kind of accounted in, you know, for funding their travel, um, for fixing a date well in advance so that it can happen. I really hope that it does happen and the pandemic doesn't do something else. Um, <laughs> um, ethics, we were very lucky that um, Health Talk already has blanket ethics. Um, and so we didn't have to apply individually, you know, it's just every, so there's a blanket ethics that goes on and every time you add a new module, you just kind of put that as an amendment. 
sorry, I didn't talk about uh, sampling recruitment. So our PPI panel was absolutely central um, for kind of um, sampling and recruitment. But in, in terms of kind of guiding us, so HIV is highly, highly, highly stigmatized. And also we're talking about women who are, you know, intersectionally disadvantaged. A lot of them are, are black women, uh, you know, or, or ethnic minority women. They might be, you know, new, new migrants to this country. They might be working out all of the systems and actually getting access is very difficult. Um, so, you know, much of the reason for having the kind of study team and the, and the ad panel that, you know, we identified at the time of the application was keeping in mind all of those things and also linking up with HIV uh, organizations across the country beforehand. Um, for the application, I also did five PPI interviews where I already had links with a person who works as a as a, an outreach worker, um, as well as people, you know, people who are working in, in HIV clinics. And so I went and visited um, women living with it, mothers living, new mothers living with HIV and told them this is the plan. What, you know, what was your experience of, of infant feeding decisions? And they, you know, and they completely, they were like, oh my goodness, please do this because it's a mess. And, you know, I was so frightened and, you know, nobody was listening and you hear that, you know, in terms of sexual transmission, there's something called U equals U, which is um, undetectable means untransmittable. Um, so, you know, if you have HIV and you are virally suppressed, you're taking your medications, you cannot pass it on through sex, but that hasn't happened for breastfeeding and women are left very confused about that. Why is that? So they were very happy about this. Um, and the PPI contributors contributed to, you know, the, the plain English summary, the plan about recruitment, how we're going to recruit, the kinds of questions we're going to ask, how we're going to ask them, all of those things. And we carried on with, the, with that level of PPI involvement all the way through. Um, how am I doing for time? Stop, stop soon. Okay. So just in terms of the pandemic and, how, and, and all of the other messiness of life, I submitted it in July 2019. That was stage one, and it was just before the summer holidays. I think the RFPB deadline is, is end of July, isn't it? So my son got chicken pox. Uh, my, so more senior co-PI took a job in another university. So she kind of was no longer on board in terms of helping me. Um, one of the main co-applicants was hospitalized. So she, <laughs> so she suddenly wasn't there. Another one went on maternity leave. So it was not ideal. And so even with the best made plans, this might happen. So you kind of need to make the, your plans even better so that if this happens, you don't actually don't, you know, fall to pieces. I did fall to pieces a little bit, but I kind of got it together in the end. Um, the other thing which was mentioned earlier was PPI contributors payments, which was when I realized that if you're on benefits, then you might lose your benefits if you get, if you get any money from PPI. And I found that really regressive and frustrating. And in the end, I found a way in which I could pay them in kind. So I said, this is the amount I can pay you. What do you want? And I bought it for them and I put it on my, claimed it back. But um, this was with the help with the R RDS um, because they'd done something similar before. Um, stage two was in November and responding to the reviewers' comments, I was very polite to <laughs> all of the questions and all of the clarifications that they wanted. And it was actually really useful because it made me think about it as a real project as opposed to wouldn't it be wonderful to do it. Um, and um, we got the outcome in March. The plan was to start in, in, in autumn 2020. And then, you know, of course, March happened. We were like, oh, we'll start it two weeks late. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, we did start it in 2021. Oh, is this one stop? Oh, there we go. So we did start it in April 2021. Um, and it's been, you know, it, all of that pain of, of working everything out and doing all of that legwork and the, you know, was well worth it because it's so wonderful to have a team that really is on board with what we're trying to do. They feel passionate about it. The PPI team are wonderful. The ad panel is wonderful. I mean, I love it. <laughs> so, so it's been a real joy, um, apart from kind of, you know, the application being really stressful, but it's, um, it was well worth putting in all that detail. Thank you very much. <laughs> so so I, I, I think that Tanvi's just given you the, the demonstration of all the points that I made. Uh, I, I think her passion clearly illustrates, you know, she's been able to convince me uh, and actually, this is the first time we've met, even though we come from the same 
part of the world yeah. and, and, and both work on maternal health. It convinced me of the importance of the question. Um, clearly, the thinking through with the PPI members has made a huge difference to the study design, uh, which is paying off now, which means that, you know, working at that point means that you'll have life easy when you're actually doing the project. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Charlie, do you have any questions? No questions? Any questions from the audience? Okay, can I ask? If you could do anything differently, knowing what you know now, apart from uh, stopping the pandemic, <laughs> um, what would you do differently? Um, yeah, it's, what would I do differently? Um, and nothing is an okay answer because clearly you were very successful. Yeah, well, I suppose a bit, um, I don't need, so many things were unanticipated um, and possibly I should have, you know, tried to attend one of these kinds of things maybe to just get a better sense of how to, it was my first ever funding application. <laughs> so, um, so, so I'm just going to say it was my fifth ever funding application that was my first successful <laughs> one. So, so I dare not go in as PPI again because I'm like, it's not going to work this time. <laughs> Um, Charlie has a question. Yeah, yeah. So, um, this question is about really about gift vouchers. So, do gift vouchers eliminate the benefit issue for PPI patients? It is so important to consider this, isn't it, when we're trying to research and co-create, um, particularly with deprived communities. Um, Paula can talk about it, but I don't think so. I, I think that gift vouchers also count. There is a, gift but vouchers are like cash. Yeah. they're like cash. Yeah. Um, so that's why I kind of. Sometimes I bought toys for their babies. Sometimes I asked them what would they like. I said, this is the amount that I can, you know, I, I need to, you know, reimburse you for. What would you like? And I just bought stuff on Amazon and I put it on my account and then I claimed it back. And that was with the advice of the RDS because they, you know, there was, a, there was a researcher there who'd had the same problem. Also, I found it was, you know, I didn't want to ask them if they were on benefits. I felt like it's none of my business. So um, I just, yeah. Just picking up on, on, on some of the unexpected happens, um, we do allow people to defer if they want to, if you're successful at stage one, um, and the unexpected happens, like obviously many unexpected things happened, uh, people can defer their stage two applications. So don't be afraid to ask if you're in that kind of situation of, of unexpected things happening. Uh, we're all human and we know those kind of things do happen. So um, yeah, do feel feel free to get in touch if you're in that uh, situation. And I should say that we have about 60% of projects that get through to stage two are successful. Um, and quite often, even if they're not successful that time, we give you some feedback. We welcome you coming back um, and you might be successful uh, the, the next time. As I said, it took me five goes, but I got there in the end and look where I've ended up. <laughs> Any other questions? No, brilliant. So thank you so much um, and a great double act. <laughs> You're following a really good double act, but thank you very much. Yeah.